Well, folks, it's that time of year again, a time of reflection and renewal, of discovering untapped potential and making honest strides to utilize it. I don't know about you, but I've got some pretty exciting plans for the upcoming year, and I'm sure y'all will get a kick out of them once they come to light. But instead of making promises for 10 minutes and then disappointing you for the next 51 odd weeks, I figured, given the demand, y'all might want to know what I got up to last year. So here it is. From the vast sea of media, video games, music, TV, and cinema, here are my top 7 of 2023. Now before we begin, I feel the need to clarify that what I'm listing here is not the greatest products of last year, although I'll keep it confined to that where possible. No, today I'm looking at the multimedia masterpieces, new and old, that I personally discovered during our last Solar Orbit and wanted to rant about in the event I never get around to covering them in full. So, with all that established, let's all collectively agree that 2023 was a fantastic year for video games. It's hard to dispute that between Tears of the Kingdom, Alan Wake 2, Super Mario Wonder, and Hi-Fi Rush along with a bunch of others, the interactive media sphere flourished last year. Unfortunately, I did not play any of those games. Instead, when I wasn't obsessively sliding around Apex Legends or actively avoiding Destiny 2, I was stepping outside my very well-established FPS comfort zone with new experiences like Deltarune Chapter 1, Unravel 2, and the game I wish could take top spot, Baldur's Gate 3. But, since I only picked up Game of the Year a week ago and therefore haven't finished it, it fails to qualify. Trust me, if it did, it'd steal this spot. What I did finish back in April, and quickly fell in love with soon after, was Studio Don't Nod's 2015 hit, Life is Strange. The surreal, iconic, and wonderfully divisive title has gained quite the infamous reputation online, and while I agree with much, even most of the critique, I think many gamers, even the supporters, really missed the forest for the trees with this one. Underneath the convoluted story but genuinely original mechanics lies a story about how responsibility shapes identity, how fragile yet necessary human connection is, and, most importantly, who deserves love. Throw in a few spectacular performances from Hannah Tell and Ashley Birch, plus a well-developed atmosphere of nostalgia, and you, apparently, have the recipe for a game I can't help but adore. But, as they say, if you have one, you have none, so I also played the prequel Before the Storm, which, despite lacking the Don't Nod touch, was admittedly a much more polished experience, with better visuals and a more focused story. Why bring this up? Well, because it was during the game's train ride in Episode 1 that I was introduced to the earworm that is Through the Cellar Doors by Lanterns on the Lake. And I guess God loves me, because literally the same week I played, the band released their newest album, Versions of Us, and yes, that is going to steal the spot for best music of 2023. English by birth, awesome by choice, Lanterns on the Lake has joined my Spotify playlists as one of my favorite indie rock bands. I'm still working my way through their back catalog, but in my not-so-humble opinion, Versions of Us is their greatest album. And what else would you expect when you've got Radiohead's Phil Selway working the drums? Between his nigh-perfect percussion, Hazel Wilde's hypnotic voice, and the overarching themes of love contending with destiny, there isn't a single song amiss in this ode to romance and tragedy. I can't say anything more the album doesn't say for itself, so make sure to go cue it up as we move on from music, but not the auditory realm, while taking a look at podcasts. I spent the first half of the year quite distracted with film and a certain anime series, but it turns out picking up a day job that allows me to plug in earbuds provides plenty of opportunity to delve into the podcast scene. And boy did I delve. Of course, there's the staple education and informational content like Aaron Mankey's Lore and NPR's Life Kit, and specifically news and interviews within the creator space like Anthony Padilla's I Spend a Day With and The Colin and Samir Show. I joined the masses in enjoying Joe Rogan and Critical Role, and while I really wanted to give this spot to the boys on the Trash Taste podcast who win the award for Hardest Laughs, they come in very close second to the surprise masterpiece that was, of all things, Season 1 of Dungeons & Daddies. Organized by media legend Freddie Wong and joined by Anthony, Matt, Will, and Beth, as well as guest stars like our previously mentioned Ashley Birch, Season 1 of Dungeons and & Daddies, as you might expect, is a thrilling homebrewed D&D-inspired romp about four dads who, well, if you know you know, and if you don't, go listen. 
But you see, I expected all of that going in. What I didn't expect, and dearly treasured, was the earnest and sincere exploration of fatherhood, manliness, responsibility, and family that unfurled over the course of the series. The production value is slick, the presentation immaculate, and at its core, it's just five friends enjoying a simple and heartfelt story. One, I often had to pause so I could laugh when I didn't have to pause to cry. I can't say much more without spiraling into a rant, but it is, without a doubt, one of my favorite stories from the macrocosm of the internet, and I am so glad to have stumbled upon it. Speaking of stumbling upon, this wonderful platform we all enjoy browsing has a remarkable sense of suggestion, and last year I discovered many a new creator worthy of my attention and time. None, however, captured my mind quite as well as fellow essayists Cursed Judge and Jacob Geller. And yes, I am cheating a bit by selecting both in this spot, but hey, it's my list. It's not hard to see why I gravitated to both creators. In a year we've already established was dominated by gaming, these two have an exceptional eye for Ludo narrative. Judge's voice could lull me to sleep in the very best way as he digs into the psychology and emotionality behind interactive entertainment, stringing together several titles with thematic focus I have, admittedly, learned from and applied in my own productions. Geller, on the other hand, has a keen mind for the intellectual, reaching to the outskirts of the academic to pull knowledge from, and introducing me to gaming titles the likes of which I've never previously heard of. He tackles big subjects in big videos, his commentary on sci-fi and horror tropes refreshing as well as digestible. I couldn't pick one over the other, both have influenced this channel in their own way and deserve as much support as I can get. Here, this one's to you guys. Have a blessed 2024. You earned it. Opposite the emerging digital creator landscape and newest forms of media, we have the classic. The bread and butter. The basics and foundations of all other advanced art forms. Of course, I'm talking about the page turner. The bound writ, the comic, the novel, the book. Back in January, I reread Jeff Smith's seminal comic series Bone, which I credit as a major artistic inspiration. On the newer end of the spectrum, we have Robert Kirkman's Invincible, which I haven't finished yet, but 40 issues in, I can tell it's worthwhile. I also started William Gibson's Neuromancer, which, for the record, is 50 years ahead of its time, and I can barely keep up with it, and I've also been enjoying Stephen Bruce's Jureg Saga. But I think we all know who the winner is here. You've heard me raving about it many a time, so how could it be anything else but Matt Alt and his joyful excursions into Japanese pop culture with pure invention? The rare non-fiction novel to grace my gaze, Alt's writing is not only distinguished, straightforward, and wonderfully clever, but surprisingly hands-on as he describes his personal anecdotes with the subject at hand. It's brilliant insight not only into the country of Japan itself and its recent lost decades, but into the power of pop culture more generally, and how creativity builds upon itself in an endless weave, much to the benefit of those the world over. And speaking of Japanese pop culture, anime is the only serialized cinema I consume, so don't be surprised at the pickings as we take a look at contenders for top television show. There are more than a few that quickly come to mind, including The Ancient Magus Bride, whose second season I'm still working through. I did, however, catch up just in time for Attack on Titan's grand finale, and while that conclusion gave me the chills, this time it's going to be another controversial throwback, as no other show this year has stayed with me, quite like A1 and Studio Trigger's Darling in the Franks. Now, let's all agree right now, that second arc doesn't exist. No, really, it doesn't. But even if it did, all you'll catch me talking about are the first 15 episodes, which is perfection incarnate, if you don't mind me saying. I can't gush enough over the immaculate writing, creative direction, experimental editing, and stark production design. But more than anything, it's the genius reversal of gender roles in an anti-beauty and the beast rom bomb that does way more to investigate sex and emotional dependency than most straight romances. And it's not merely the entangled couples, but the surrounding community and found family of our cast who find themselves interrogated by a narrative keen on promoting self-exploration and interpersonal maturity. To say I fell in love is an understatement, and my adoration of this show's messages is rivaled only by my disappointment in its finale. But that's alright, because we have one category left, and I think you're gonna like it. Now, here's the strange thing. 2023 was, without a doubt, a great year for cinema. 
I certainly can't say otherwise. I mean, I spent the first six months making movie reviews, and yet, despite my best efforts, I've somehow seen less movies this year than any time since the pandemic. So, as you can imagine, I found this last section of the list difficult to round out, until I remembered some highlights. In January, I saw last year's The Menu, an insightful thriller that's less about food and more about the creative process than I think anybody really realized. Seriously, please watch this if you haven't already. And in April, we had Suzume, a film that, for all its flaws, presents a truly original premise with a lot to say about memory, relationships, and cultural identity. Across the Spider-Verse is still a visual feast, and the massive weight of unbearable talent is a movie of the decade contender for all the reasons I mentioned and a little video over there. And in all honesty, its or any of these other films probably deserve this spot. But that would rob me of the chance to highlight a little film with a lot of heart that nearly slipped under my radar. And that would be Nimona. Based off the charming graphic novel I actually read a number of years ago, Nimona is one of those rare adaptations that knows exactly what it's doing and really carves out a name for itself separate from its source with a fresh art direction and colorful writing I only want to see more of. And that's only talking about the technicalities. Focused entirely on telling a story about acceptance, betrayal, loyalty, sacrifice, and what else? Love. This film's finale is not only spectacle galore, but draws on imagery with such ruthless efficiency, I really can't help but adore it. So there you have it, my favorites of 2023. This was super fun to whip together. Let me know if you want to see a full video on any of these properties, because we're coming up on the end of Evangelion, literally and figuratively, and I want to know what else you want to see. I hope you all had a great New Year's, and I wish you all the best of luck with whatever resolutions you're definitely going to complete this year. Until then, I've been Jaro, y'all have been amazing, and I'll see you all on the bright side. Happy 2024, and God bless.